Now, I, I got to be honest. I've got three boys. Uh, Ethan's in the back there. He's uh, uh, doing his thing. Um, and, and I put this on Facebook a lot. So if you're friends with me, you all know that, that I love my church family. You guys, excuse me, you mean the world to me. But I got to be honest. I don't know that there's anybody in this room tonight that I would give Ethan for in exchange for you. And I'm not saying that to be ugly. I'm just, I'm being, I'm, I'm being honest when I say that. But God loved us so much. He wanted us to be in his family that he was willing to give his own son for that. So knowing all of this, how could we possibly think that God would take our salvation away from us? So if no individual can do it and God's not going to do it, the next person on our list was Satan. All right, Romans 8.33 says this, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. All right. In this verse, Paul is referring to Satan. The Bible makes it clear that Satan's role is to bring accusations against the believer. Uh, in Revelation 12.10, he's referred to, referred to as the accuser. That's actually what the name Satan means. It, it means accuser. Um, as, as I was studying for this, I, I, the part of the, my study took me to the book of Zechariah. And I've got to be honest, I haven't spent much time in the book of Zechariah. Uh, I, I get to it, and I'm, I'm reading, and I'm seeing flying scrolls, and I'm seeing all these things, and, and my eyes just kind of, I mean, I, I hate to admit this, my eyes kind of glaze over. But as I was studying this, I came across this absolutely beautiful story. Uh, you, you might want to write this down. You don't have to turn there real quick, because it'll take forever to find Zechariah. But... Um, Zechariah chapter 3, starting in verses 1 and 2, it says this. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and, state, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So basically the setup is we've got Joshua. He's standing before the Lord. And over on the side is Satan. And Satan is hurling accusations against Joshua. And verse 2 says this. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So we've got, we've got Satan firing accusations against Joshua, and the Lord stands up and basically says, Satan, that's enough. He's one of my chosen. And then, and like I said, this is one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever come across in the Bible. Verses 3 through 5 say this. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Zechariah 3, 3 through 5. Satan has no power to make accusations against us. He may bring any number of arguments against us, but for those of us that are believers, we're seen as blameless. They're, they're, God doesn't see our sin. Matt Chandler, uh, another preacher that, that's been influential in my life, said this, um, there, and this is basically God talking to a believer, there is no one who condemn you. I don't, and if I don't, no one can. Who will even bring a charge against you? Your mind. What court could possibly charge you? Everything's mine. So we've seen that no individual can, can separate us from God's salvation. God's not going to do it. Satan is powerless to do it. That brings us to Jesus. Would Jesus be the one to take away our salvation? Romans 8.34 says this, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. All right, I'm not going to go through the list again, but is it possible that Jesus will take back what he's given to us? Um, we should be eternally grateful that the answer again is no. Jesus is not going to take our salvation from us. He even said this himself in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If Jesus were to take away our salvation, he would be nullifying the promise that he just made in that verse. Romans 8.34 go, excuse me, goes on to list four protections that we have for the security of our salvation. 
Uh, the first one is Jesus died on the cross. And, and I, I don't think I need to elaborate on that. Second, he was raised from the dead, and by doing so, he completely defeated sin and death. Isaiah 25, 8 says this, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall take away from all of the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. The third, this third security we have is that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. This is a place of honor. If you remember, there was a, a story in the Gospels how James and John wanted to come, and they wanted to sit at the right hand of God. And, and they were doing it because they knew that it was the most important seat. Right now, Jesus is up in heaven, and he's sitting in that place of honor. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says this, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The last protection we have there is that Jesus is in heaven interceding for us. And, and, and I had to look this word up. The word interceding means to act as an advocate between two parties. Um, basically, we talked about how Satan is bringing accusations. Jesus is there to hear the accusations, and he's in turn saying, you know what, it's taken care of. Uh, on the ride over here, um, we, Tina and I were talking about something in the front, and we have our, our son Jack, who is a, uh, uh, just a bright, I mean, obviously I'm his dad, so I'm going to say nice things about him. But he, he is just a very, very smart boy. And he was asking us, is, we, I said Satan, and he was asking me, is Satan the devil? And so I, I got to explain to him that, yes, Satan was the devil. And he asked me, well, where is Satan now? And so I told him, I said, most likely, Satan is up in heaven tattling on you and me right now. Because, you know, he's five, he understands about tattling. And, he's, and so I got to explain to him that, and, and obviously I'm, I'm making most of this up, but um, that Satan has an office up there, and he's got a cell phone, and he's got, he's got his demons all over the place, and the demons are watching you and me. And every time they see us do something that would be a sin, they immediately type in Satan's number on the, uh, on the cell phone, and they call him, and Satan goes running as fast as he can before God to tell God, what it was that we just did. And fortunately, we have, an inter, we have Jesus up there interceding for us. And he goes, you know what, Satan? I got this. It's taken care of. Um, excuse me. Hebrews 7.25, this is the Bible version of that story I just told. Um, Wherefore, he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for, him, for them. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus will not take away our salvation. He loved us so much that he was willing to die for it. Um, here's a couple verses on that. Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And Philippians 2, 7 through 8 says, But he made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All right, up to this point, we've looked at the individuals who, could, who we could make the argument might be able to take away our salvation. And we've seen that individuals can't do it. God's not going to do it. Satan is powerless to do it. And Jesus has promised that he won't do it. Now we're going to transition in and we're going to look at the circumstances. And, and, and I think all of us find circumstances in our lives. And, and from time to time, they may become overwhelming to the point where we might say, why in the world is this happening to me? God, why am I going through this? Why am I going through this? Let me read, um, let me read verses 35 through 39. Or I'm going to read 35 through 37 again in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. 
we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principality. Oh, I'm sorry, I went too far. Nay, let me read 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I skipped down just a bit, pardon me. Um, right now we've got, in these verses here, particularly in verse 35, we've got Paul listing out a, a, an entire series of things that a Christian might experience. Um, the first one that he has there is the word tribulation. And that tribulation it has the idea of somebody being under great pressure, as if, as if you're put under a rock and you're just being, being pressed down. And, and these, can be, these can be external pressures. These could also be internal pressures where you've just got things built up and you're, you're just tearing yourself apart because of them. Uh, the next one there that he has is distress. And, and the idea behind that is is that you're hemmed in, that it feels like there's no way that you can get out of it. Now, fortunately, 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says that God has provided a way so that if we have those temptations, God will provide a way for us to resist those temptations, and, and, and he, will, he will allow us to resist them until the time of escape is there. 